Do I wait for the do, do I wait for the moderator? I wait for uh, the moderator. Professor Inyang? Yes, I am I am on waiting for the moderator. Oh moderator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start uh, this webinar. Uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, introduce briefly about uh, Professor Hilary Inyang. Uh, he is uh, uh, the president of uh, uh, Global Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, Advanced uh, Analysis and Design uh, in the United States. Uh, and he is also the uh, UNESCO uh, consultant uh, on water, water security. And uh, he is also the former U.S. Ambassador's Distinguished Scholar to uh, Ethiopia. And uh, now here in uh, the International, International Society uh, of uh, uh, Environmental Ge Technology, uh, he served as the Honorable uh, President. Uh, and he is also uh, friends of uh, many uh, universities in China, such as Nanjing University, uh, China University of Mining and Technology and others. And he also have done very uh, active and uh, extensive uh, research related to uh, environmental uh, geotech geotechnics. Um, let's welcome uh, Professor Yin Yang to uh, give the keynote lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Hongdu. I'm always very pleased uh, to uh, talk with uh, colleagues and share my ideas and learn from so many uh, different colleagues on their research all over the world. I am here today to talk about, in this lecture, to talk about uh, erosion as a menace uh, in many parts of the world, particularly uh, the uh, programs for the uh, Road and Belt Initiative. As you know, the Road and Belt Initiative crosses very many countries in Asia, in um, Africa, which is only at this time just um, Kenya, but uh, much of Eastern Europe. So the terrain uh, that this um, Belt and Road Initiative covers is very diverse. It's very, very diverse. So um, what I have done done is to divide my lecture into three component parts. The first one, the first one is um, dealing with the, the rationale for considering erosion as a very important geotechnical uh, feature. The second part is um, the mechanics of erosion and the types of erosion that should be expected in those terrains that are traversed by the road and belt initiative and then finally what to do about it what do you do about erosion what geotechnical and geochemical techniques are there that could be used to solve this problem so being that i have um, provided a copy of this lecture uh, to the bri seminar series i will skip through quite a number of slides because of the time uh, but I will touch the essential elements, so please bear with me. First, root elements of the Belt and Road Initiative as an introduction. What are the objectives of the and scale of BRI? Of course, you know that BRI, other than the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, constitutes one of the largest, perhaps the largest ever infrastructure development project in the world. So one of the objectives, of course, is infrastructure connectivity between nations, between regions of the world. Strategy and coordination of efforts on sustainable development and a number of other trade and finance related objectives. In terms of the scale of coverage, about 60 countries are prime, 63% of the global population and 29% of the global GDP is covered. The roads are very diverse. BRI routes include 
the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, the China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor, and a number of others. What are the warrants for consideration of erosion as a major part, what I would call a major stressor for the realization of the BRI? First, there are many land routes of the BRI, and those land routes traverse very high relief countries. Of course, um, all of us in geotechnical engineering are very aware of the uh, nature of terrain in some parts of Southeast Asia, in some parts of Asia proper, and in some parts of Eastern Europe, all the way to the Alps uh, in uh, uh, Eurasia. Now, many linear facilities are also involved. So there is then the prospect that these long linear facilities will traverse a whole lot of terrain that has very different relief uh, in terms of valleys, in terms of hills, mountains. The long traverse routes cross many soils of different physical, chemical, and strength characteristics. In some places, the soils are very unstable. So erosion must be considered one of the greatest geotechnical stressors that will confront the full operation of the BRI. I wanted to show this pictorially. If you look at this map that is before you, you will see the various segments of the BRI. Those of them that are land routes are shown in orange. And those of them that are sea routes are shown in blue. Of course, our concern is uh, basically on the land routes. You see that it goes all the way from Guangzhou to Laranzhou to um, Calcutta in India, and then all of the northern part of Asia running all the way to Eastern Europe. And in some cases, it goes all the way to Italy. As you can see there on the top left-hand corner, you have um, Roma. Okay, if you show this in the form of a sketch that some people have already drawn up, these are from others, not myself, you see that the route goes through terrain that is in some cases dominated by dunes. So you are likely to have a lot of sand movement uh, taken by the wind. And you also see the rough terrain at the bottom. You see that road uh, is threatened by landslides because you have very high relief on slopes on the roadside. So this is why erosion has to be considered a very significant parameter, geotechnical process. Now, in terms of soils, you see that some people have mapped the soils in different parts of the world. If you were to align and superimpose the BRI roots on the different kinds of soil, you see that you have the red soil there, Castanozem, which is a soil in the Kazakh part uh, characterized in the Kazakh part of uh, Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. And then you have many other types of soil. So the BRI will traverse many, many soils of different types, some of which will have unstable characteristics. Um, this is taken by remote sensing. You see that some segments of the roads also have high relief. The reason you have those rivers incising very deep, the incision of the rivers that have high slopes, because these are the upper courses of rivers. In the upper courses of rivers, valleys are usually V-shaped and very prone to landslides and prone to uh, geotechnical instabilities of different types. So this makes the case for consideration of erosion as a very significant process. Now, what are some of the uh, routes that have been proposed? Some of them are actually in existence at this time that uh, would be subject to this kind of erosion. Baku, Tbilisi, Kars Railway, and Azerbaijan, Bangkok, Nakong, Rachisima, uh, Nongai Road Railway in Thailand, Orange Line Metro train station in Pakistan, East Coast Rail Link project in Malaysia, and a number of others. I just elected to select this few, but all of them are linear infrastructure that will pass through many terrains, some stable, some unstable, and warrants the consideration of erosion and the 
development of design measures from a range of options to mitigate that problem. So the uh, second part of this um, lecture deals with identification and scaling of erosion types applicable to BRI areas. Uh, what, uh, how is erosion a threat to infrastructure? Loss of farmland due to hydraulic erosion along the routes, destruction of houses, bridges, and other structures, deposition of sediments in pristine habitats, a number of people have raised that as a, a demerit of BRI, but there are geotechnical measures to use to stabilize those. Severance of transportation links, ecological damages, coverage of farms and civil facilities by migrating sand, especially in the outlying areas that are deserts. Wind erosion will be a factor and will re result in the migration of dunes and the deposition of dust in many places. Soiling of structures by dust again, and of course, health problems caused by dust inhalation. Uh, during the past two to three decades, there have been many physical, chemical, and health-related uh, models that show that as you inhale a lot of dust, there are all kinds of ailments asthma, and many others that could result. I have also elected to show picturally uh, the nature of um, gully erosion. I visited some sites. You typically see uh, this kind of damage when it is gully erosion, some built infrastructure, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner, that soil has been stripped from a gutter that was constructed earlier. These are some of the things to expect, especially where you have dispersive soils along BRI routes worldwide. Now, I took this picture somewhere in, I think, um, I'm not sure, it must have been uh, in Asia someplace, but you see that on the top picture has a lot of dust settling on vegetation. BRI will involve a lot of construction activity in some places as extension of segments of routes. And that will generate dust if uh, geotechnical measures are not taken to control. And in the one below, I have made a representation of inhalation of dust and to show that it does go into the lungs as a result of that vehicular traffic that you see there. Not uh, all VRI segments are like this, but those that will undergo construction, construction will definitely result in the generation of dust in a way that is um, somewhat similar to what I have shown. Now, what are the critical mechanisms of erosion that we should be concerned about? So now we are entering more into the geotechnical elements of this lecture. There are many kinds of uh, mechanisms that um, um, are embodied in erosion as a process, uh, but Generally, the parameters are grouped into those that are of soil texture, uh, the depth of soil. Of course, erosion typically is a surficial process. Topography, I have already talked about the impact of relief. Topographies that are greater than 30% gradients tend to have a lot of slides. But even those that are lower, even up to lower down to 5% could result in erosion, hydraulic erosion during floods. Uh, then soil erodibility, those have to deal with the physical chemical characteristics of the soil. Some soils are more easily detached than others. Then there is the potential soil risk. So a lot of people have uh, developed mechanisms and models. Among them, the most popular one is that of Corinne in 1992. Uh, that includes things like stoniness, soil depth, soil texture to develop an erodibility index. We will not get into the erodibility index today, but to look at the processes and the geotechnical options that can be undertaken to control erosion. Erosion is also a geotechnical process. And when we talk about geotechnical process, one of the biggest characteristics that we tend to look at with respect to geotech geotechnical damage of facilities is that of sheer strength of soil, more column relationships. We know that for any given soil uh, that has that 
normal stress is imposed, there will be one value of shear stress. If the normal stress is increased, the shear stress will typically increase in sands and stay the same in clays. This has significant implications in the erosivity of soils. Uh, the more volume envelope uh, can be used to describe parameters. As I said today, I'm not uh, to get into the specific details of this, but measures that can be undertaken to control. Just to illustrate the significance of what I just mentioned, the picture to the top left is an example of a slump on a roadway. That's an erosion, gully erosion that resulted in a slide. And if we are to look at that, some other people have already drawn the diagram for us to look at, a representation of that failure on that roadway. You see on the right-hand side, top right-hand side, that wedge has slid down, much like what will happen in most of the roadway segments in areas of high terrain. Uh, areas of uh, rough terrain along BRI. So to see the landslide material, we were to look at the dynamics of that slide. You see that weight has been put on an inclined uh, circular surface and it slides down to attain stability. And on the left-hand side is a schematic that illustrates the same thing. Erosion that does also constitute, contributes to erosion. In areas of high rainfall intensity, there's often gully erosion and sheet erosion. But at the very basic level, we can look at that process this way, that it is the kinetic energy of raindrops that detaches soil material. So we have to find some way of converting that kinetic energy into sharing stress that is imposed by the soil by each raindrop and then compound them for several raindrops. So it is not uh, uh, surprising then that a number of equations from first principles can be used to describe that erosion process, that of hydraulic erosion that is induced directly by rainfall. The kinetic energy of any rainfall drop can be illustrated or described using equation one. That is half mass times velocity squared. It's basically half mass times velocity squared. But the shearing stress that it is imposed by the soil by each raindrop can be calculated as um, being a functional notation multiplied by the diameter of that raindrop. So in areas of torrential rainfall, where raindrops are heavy, large raindrops, there's bound to be greater erosive force. Rainfall intensity is I and T is the duration of the rainfall. But the shearing resistance of the soil against that raindrop is the typical Mercolum relationship that we can derive, showing that the shearing resistance is equal to uh, tau uh, tan phi, the angle of internal friction of that soil plus the cohesion C, and then multiplied by contact area of the soil particle A. So by looking at these parameters, we can look at very specific uh, features or characteristics in order to uh, increase the shearing resistance or prevent rainfall from going to that sector at all using geotechnical measures like diversion, like uh, design elements that cover up and reduce the impact of rainfall. So this is at the very basic principle. Now, um, to further show, illustrate those processes. Uh, first, when rain falls, if there's going to be an impact on erosion, there's going to have to be a detachment, detachment of soil particles. Then from that detachment of soil particles, you would then have the translocation by transport of the sediments that have been produced for deposition in other places. That is illustrated in the diagram shown in the lower left corner. Of course, we all know 
that the nature of the terrain, not just the slope, but the roughness of the surface over which that sediment moves is a contributor to runoff. And that is illustrated on the right hand side on the lower bottom, that's the right hand side. If it is bare grass, the runoff volumes and velocities will be very high, the bare slope. That's why you have it shown as the topmost one there in that graph. The middle one is grass. Grass will tend to uh, cause reductions in velocity. And then straw mulching, which represents a higher level of roughness of the ground and the capacity of that surface to hold water too, will further reduce erosive uh, processes. So this opens the way for us to implement geotechnical measures that can improve ground roughness so that erosion can be reduced. Of course, plain and smooth surfaces result in a fast movement of the fluids of water. Now, um, another indication is that cracking is a contributor to erosion. Uh, typically in gully erosion, cracks will first start, as you see on the right-hand side, cotton cracks. Professor Tang, who is listening to this lecture from Nanjing University, is well aware of this, because he and I have collaborated on a number of research journal articles on cracking in soils, and a number of others at the University of North Carolina, my ex-students and Postdocs have also worked with beyond soil cracking. So it is a precursor in, uh, in certain places where conditions favor, conditions of uh, desiccation will favor the development of cracks that eventually could result in powdering of the soil to make soil particles available for air lifting by wind forces. So things can also be done to stabilize that as we can see later on. I have uh, decided to characterize the three stages of dust generation as follows. Uh, you have stage one, in which you have the base soil, desiccation and associated cracking. That's stage one. If you move further down, you have stage two, soil powdering through particle release. And then stage three, particle mobility and entrainment in the atmosphere due to wind action. So essentially, so far we've talked about two modes of erosion. Erosion as a result of uh, water action in soil, and now we are talking about erosion as a result of wind action on exposed soil surfaces. Things can be done to control, but to do that, we have to look at what the stressing mechanism is in each stage. In stage one, the stressing mechanism is low humidity and high temperature gradient. Stage two is low humidity and high temperature gradient as well. And stage three, of course, wind, so wind forces that are imposed on the particle as they make them to roll on the ground uh, for a while until they are air lifted into the atmosphere. Then resisting mechanism in most of the cases will be soil strength, which we can, in this case, defined as cohesion, when it is mostly clear, tensile strength of soil, especially those soils that are cemented uh, by stabilization, cohesion, high liquid retention capacity. That is why we pour water at construction sites so that the soil can remain moist, so that it will be difficult to detach particles to make the particles be airborne by wind. Particle weight and inertia, upslope gradient also make it more difficult for dust to be generated. There are a number of measures. In my case, for several years, we did experiments and theoretical models on the use of aqueous polymer to stabilize the soils against erosion. And many other people have done different things. Just before this lecture, we were talking about char that is favored by some researchers at Nanjing University. And there are other cases in which others have used a variety of materials to control dust erosion, as well as um, water erosion. So what I just 
explained to you earlier, I have illustrated uh, in papers that are to come out in the next six months or so. Um, typically, you see on the left-hand side, you have soil that is in an undisturbed condition. That is, that soil contains poor fluid. But as a result of the stresses that I mentioned earlier, you have progression to stage two in which that liquid starts to evaporate. When the liquid starts to evaporate, the uh, tensile stresses are set on the soil surface, so they begin to crack. And when they crack, at some point, the density of the cracks will become so much that you can consider that soil surface to be powdered. And when they are powdered, it means that some small particles that are no longer so heavy are now available for being airlifted by wind. And that's what I have illustrated on the right-hand side. So we expect some of these things to happen along BRI routes, especially those that are in the northern part of Eurasia or some parts of China and India, and even in um, East Africa, where you have Kenya trying to do some things in BRI too, because uh, some of those areas have uh, typically areas of low humidity and there's a lot of evaporation, um, the climatic factors come in. And quite frankly, in some places, you have the effects of global climate change uh, that lay the ground bare uh, to win action of the type that generates this type of erosion. Now, so that's my illustration of that circumstance. What are the erosion control measures? And this is uh, the most interesting part because when we identify the problems, we have to find solutions. And we are now saying that there is a catalog of geotechnical measures that can be implemented in a lot of these areas to mitigate the impact of erosion, either gully erosion, sheet erosion, wind erosion. Let's look at a number of them. I will rush through them, I, can, I must warn you, because we don't have a lot of time. So I would like to rush through them. How much time have I got? Uh, what time is this? Uh, this 20 minutes. Okay, I now have about uh, 10 or so minutes to rush through this. Now, so erosion control measures that are adaptable to BRI projects. Let's run through them. Uh, one of the researchers here in Nigeria, as early as 1983, decided to classify these erosion control measures. This was his classification system. His name was Uzomaka. And sheet erosion, he looked at various ways of preventing to include agricultural measures, some measures that are very common in agriculture, like mulching and so forth. And then gully erosion, of course, there is the reclamation, the stabilization using a number of measures. The green measures could be engineering or agricultural. I suppose agricultural could be explained as uh, ex establishing vegetation on, on those eroded uh, slopes so that uh, erosive action can be ineffective. On the virus. First, revegetation and forestation. Along those routes, you can have biogeochemical stabilization uh, with grass because grass tend to have fibrous roots. Those fibrous roots are known for many years now, for many decades, uh, I think for even centuries, to stabilize soil against erosion. Then, tree planting can stabilize soils by running the roots across uh, potential failure surfaces, uh, sliding surfaces on the ground. Planting of indigenous leguminous plants provide mulch to the soil. So all those uh, tend to be measures that are uh, casted in revegetation and forestation. The second category, surface runoff reduction and control uh, on paved terrains, Use of collection system for roof rainwater, especially in areas that you have that, like in parks. There are parks, there are industrial parks that are supposed to be built during DRI processes, and those would survive. Geotechnical stabilization is the most frequently adopted one uh, to stabilize the slopes of roadways, 
chemical stabilization of dispersive soils, soil physical densification, because if you densify soil, then you've increased the cohesion or the tensile strength against erosive forces. Construction of soil netting and retention systems. So these are all the geotechnical systems that, um, and there are a few others that I may not have mentioned here that can be used to stabilize uh, roadways and, and train routes and pipeline routes against erosion during the Arai project. Look on the top left. Corner, top left to the so that there and Yeah. A branch is greater than the technical construction that then. Uh, Hello? Hello. Uh, yeah. Please, um, uh, we, just lost, we just lost connection there, but I'm sure it will re-establish. It will re-establish. Okay, we are no trying problem. to re-establish. Yeah, Nothing yeah. No we will re-establish very quickly. I just have uh, <laughs> six minutes or so to the end. Okay. Yes. We are trying to re-establish uh, it, yes. Okay. Okay, we've uh, re-established. Okay. okay, can you see it? Can you see yeah. it? Okay. Perfect, That's you can cool. continue. So we have that. And then you see on the right-hand side, some very uh, typical use of uh, geosynthetics to stabilize slopes. It will be necessary to do this along very many segments of the BRI. So I'll rush now. And of course, you see what I meant earlier on that uh, grass will supply roots that can stabilize soils. Look at the picture on the lower left hand. You see, we would like to have soil uh, plants that have uh, fibrous roots that go down. Obviously, the impact of those roots is to hold the soil together. Now, it is possible to develop many models. Many, many years ago, about three and a half or four decades ago, there used to be a fellow at Ohio State University, Professor Wu, who wrote a very interesting and would show the impact of uh, roots on the improvement in the sheer strength of soils. That's very good. And I think those things have to be revisited. Many more additional models, mathematical models can be developed, especially these days that you have uh, development in scanning, uh, electron microscopy, and you have um, a lot of um, uh, you know, software to deal with um, spatial distribution of points on a plane. And that can be used to verify models that are developed. Uh, these are advantages that Professor Wu did not have about 40 years ago. All right, so now on the right, the new slide. I have uh, shown there something I did at the University of Massachusetts about 15 years ago. Uh, on the top left hand corner, you see that uh, some materials can be used to stabilize cells as well. The question is what types of materials? 
because construction is involved and it involves the use of large quantities of materials. Those materials have to be locally available materials that can be sourced from the local area. It cannot be um, among Morillonite from the United States, uh, Ohio, Clays, or something like that. Uh, so materials have to be looked at close to construction sites. So this provides the opportunity for the types of research to identify those materials, characterize them, and develop both uh, models and, and, and projections on how those materials are supposed to operate and act over the years of service of the infrastructure concerned. Um, OK, let's go. Um, this brings me to the last uh, part of the lecture, uh, which will causes on what we have been active earlier than now. Uh, we embark a very large search, and um, to some extent that uh, the in Ethiopia and King University and uh, other places, including um, Korea, where one of my ex-PhD students is now very active, Professor Sonny young -Bae. Um, If you take a look at that model that is on the left, uh, we cannot just go search for materials haphazardly, materials that can be used in soil stabilization. There's got to be a concept to narrow down some stages to particular materials that behave in certain ways. And uh, that model, as we developed them in my own case, was to look for materials that will have high viscosity, high viscosity, and then other materials that can uh, uh, not flocculate clays very much because we're talking about dust. And uh, materials that uh, are entrained as dust are mostly clays. There are a number of them that are silt, but um, most of them will be clays because of lightness of the si uh, soil particles. Now, the problem with viscous materials is that some of the materials tend to flocculate clays. So acting in a way that is actually antithetic to what we want. Materials that flocculate clays result in larger pore sizes of clays, meaning that evaporation from such soils will be enhanced, which is what we don't want. So we have to establish a balance between high viscosity materials like polymers and the capacity of that material to hold moisture in soil. So that search should be the case in all cases. Yes, we limited this. We found that some materials in the tropics, especially cassava plants, in West Africa have that characteristic. That is why if you look at the pictures to the right, you see that one of the mothers of my uh, postgraduate student, I asked her to harvest tubers from Nigeria and send to me in the United States, which we use to extract starch. Uh, starch is a form of polymer and we use them to stabilize soils against dust. That is possible in many parts of the world. I know that China has many tubers, India has many tubers, South America has many tubers, Africa has many different types of tubers. But the thing is to process the polymers out of them because some of these tubers are food materials. Therefore, the water that comes from processing them as food can be used to extract the polymers and use them in soil stabilization as we have demonstrated for cassava in this case. At the physical chemical level in soils, what you would have is like what I have uh, presented here uh, in this uh, sketch. You, we want those poly polymer molecules to stick on the surfaces of soil particles and act as uh, partial barriers for the upward movement of water in soil, which would uh, cause more desiccation. If we can delay the transport of water, soil water to the ground surface where it would evaporate and cause soils to crack, then the polymers would be effective. But there are different types of polymers. 
And some soil particles, if they are sand, they are neutral, they have no charge. If they are clays, they, are, they have a negative charge. Therefore, does it mean that polymers that are positively charged and can hang on to the clay particles that are negatively charged? We would have to assess that. That would work, provided the flocculation of the soil is not excessive. So this representation I have shown here was my effort to try to show what happens in soil at the physical chemical level when such polymers are used to stabilize soil. So we would now go and search for polymers that would behave in this way. Now, um, uh, without further ado, I um, have shown here what could happen to clear part particular uh, platelets, uh, what we call platelets, clear platelets at the micro level when polymer is put in. In most cases, we would like polymer molecules to display the ion that sits there that causes soil to swell and crack when it loses much. And that is sodium. Sodium tends to be in there for monk perillonetic soil, sodium and calcium and a number of others. If the polymer can drive out the calcium and then hold the platelets together, then we have a chance to reduce dust erosion from such soils. And of course, when we find those fluids, we want to put them in a trough and spray them on soil during construction, as I've seen in the lower right-hand corner. So I will uh, stop here uh, so that uh, you can um, ask some questions. And I will conclude by saying that BRI is generating many large-scale projects in Asia, Europe, the Pacific, and Africa. These projects cross areas that are prone to geohazards of which erosion is just one. Protection of BRI projects such as roads, pipelines, railways from erosion will require the planning, design, and construction of erosion construction systems. Um, review and adaptation of existing systems as well as new systems are required. Of course, because the BRI constitutes many routes uh, that cross many countries. And most of these countries have universities that are doing a lot of research. There is then the opportunity for international collaboration. I'm particularly happy that um, Professor Shibin, the president of, uh, BR, president of um, ISEC, the secretary general, Professor Tang, Professor Hung Yu, who is part of this, who is leading this um, BRI lecture series, and several others are currently collaborating to convene talent and get very experienced and active researchers to contribute many techniques from different countries to serve the purposes of this BRI. I thank you very much for listening. I thank you very much for organizing this excellent seminar series. And I look forward to collaborating with you in various countries. And to those that are listening, I applaud uh, the effort that you put on to hook on to this uh, seminar series. I thank you, I thank you, and I thank you. Thank you, Professor In Yang. Thank you, Professor In Yang. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will take some questions if there's time. Yes. We, uh, we, we can ask several questions to uh, uh, Professor In Yang. Uh, today he has given us a very uh, excellent uh, lecture about uh, the importance of uh, erosion problem and uh, how can we uh, elevate uh, such a uh, hazard. So is there any questions? Uh, Professor Inyan, uh, it's not a question, but just uh, wanted to know more about, as you mentioned about BRI. Um, what kind of projects are there? I think you are from uh, Ethiopia, if I'm not wrong. So like what kind of projects are undergoing in, in your country, BRI? Okay, 
Um, when you say my country, uh, uh, fortunately for me, I'm a person of many, many countries. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, one, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, my career at, uh, has been 38 years in the United States, University of Massachusetts, and University of North Carolina. I'm, I'm an American, but of African origin also. So my country, there are very many. Got the United States, I got Nigeria now, maybe Ethiopia. <laughs> but uh, in terms of where I was the past uh, two years, that's Ethiopia, there is no BRI project. The way the BRI is set now is that most of the BRI land routes are in Asia and Europe. Uh, there is extension of uh, sea routes to Kenya, Kenya. So uh, yeah. African countries are currently trying to get me and others to lead the effort to extend BRI to other countries. As a matter of fact, I came to China in uh, 2017 as a keynote speaker at an event in, uh, I think it was uh, Fujian, in Fujian province to try to see how we can extend a BRI to many African countries. So at this time, BRI in Africa is limited only to Kenya. But the South Africans, it's a, South Africa, which is a country I am advising right now uh, on science and technology, they are trying to lead an effort to extend BRI to other African countries. So that's the direct answer. But there are many techniques, uh, many geoenvironmental techniques in Africa that apply to BRI for sure. And I think last week you heard uh, the vice president of ISEC for Africa, Professor Edem Antia, mm, yes. Uh, yes. a very detailed lecture about, yes. um, about um, BRI. The East Coast, yeah, the East Coast of Africa and they're very active right. uh, yeah, collaborations with China and uh, that, other countries. You see, yeah. you see that. And that is, um, that, is, uh, that is led by Kenya on the East Coast. But it would be a great idea to have that expand to Ethiopia, where I was, and expand to many others. There are many Chinese uh, projects in Africa. Uh, China, China has maybe the largest uh, investment in Africa in geotechnical train routes and many, many incorporated into BRI yet. But let's hope that they will be. Yes, it's necessary. Yes. I hope you could hear me. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank. Thank. Okay. Okay, so, and I, I suggest that uh, there be many, many collaborations with um, African countries because um, many of the BRI countries have techniques that apply to Africa and vice versa. Yes. Are there any more questions? There is one question, I'm not sure. Uh, for somebody yeah. wrote in the chat group. Um, is they are asking about the factor, I mean, have you considered any vegetation factor in the equation while calculating shear stress imposed on soils by raindrops? So vegetation, I think in one way, it helps to reduce impact of raindrops on the soil. So I think, uh, I don't know which presentation slide the this audience is referring to, but they are asking if there is any factor considered to minimize uh, the stress from the raindrops on the soil. Yeah. Yes, I am sure that uh, uh, that can be done. Um, uh, see, there are two stages of that. Um, I'm just thinking aloud. I'm thinking aloud, but because that should be a research issue. Uh, there are two conditions uh, that one can use to uh, evaluate the impact of raindrop on soils. First, should be base soil, base soil. 
There's nothing to break the kinetic energy of the dropping, uh, the raindrop. Uh -huh. That's one case. So one research that somebody should do, and I really believe that um, uh, what the gentleman or gentle lady uh, is talking about would apply, is what is the impact of vegetation in arresting the kinetic energy of raindrops? So I'm sure that vegetation on soil when I say veg vegetation, I'm talking basically this case about grass, about grass. So when rain falls, if there is grass on the ground surface, it should be possible for the grass to somewhat reduce the kinetic energy of impact of that raindrop on the ground surface. I think that somebody can set up an experiment to measure that after doing the analytical equations, they should be analytical equations. And I think if one sits down, those analytical equations can be developed. It will be an equation that uh, expresses the redu reduction in kinetic energy, perhaps using some uh, factors, uh, the factor by which the kinetic energy of the dropping uh, water uh, can be reduced as a result of the presence of that vegetation. Is something somebody should do. And I think it would make for good research. But the equation that you saw earlier is for bay soils to show that if raindrops are allowed to contact bay soils, there is a certain kinetic energy they impose. But that kinetic energy has to be converted to shearing stress, stress, shearing stress uh, to know the level of damage that can be. and to also slit of soil particles. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Oh, hello. Uh, I can... Uh, uh, good morning, Professor. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this wonderful and informative presentation. It was really great uh, hearing about all this. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Based on, uh, as you're mentioning that uh, BRI uh, is going through many countries, especially in the Middle Eastern countries, uh, most of the uh, discussion uh, that we had, uh, many of the things may not um, like uh, be applicable there because of uh, the climate there and the soil types. Uh, they, 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 there is a suspected that uh, there will be as, uh, accelerated desertation in these areas where already that are already arid or semi-arid and then techniques like soil kneeling and or maybe even more vegetation cover may not be um, uh, like um, uh, suitable uh, there because there are very few types uh, and kinds of uh, vegetation may thrive. So uh, any insight on what should be uh, the techniques uh, that uh, sh should be um, um, like applied there. Yes, I would like to characterize uh, in very generic terms, the types of terrain that this um, BRI will like, encounter in many countries into three. First, there are those countries, what I would call the stands, the Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Afghanistan, those countries with very high relief. They are countries that are very hilly. And I can even add some parts of India and China to it. Those countries have uh, very hilly terrain in large fractions of their country areas. And those, uh, most of the techniques we've talked about will apply because um, road sites are vulnerable to slides are vulnerable to mud flows and erosion uh, by rivers that are in their upper courses. As you know, uh, rivers can be divided into three courses, the upper course, the middle course, and the lower course. Mm -hmm. And when a, an area is of very high relief, it means that most of those rivers will be in their upper courses 
where the rivers and valleys are V-shaped as a result of the downward cut of uh, those rivers. So you are likely to have a lot of that. Now let's get to the Middle East. Um, now, Middle East has very diverse terrain. Some parts of the Middle East are flat and sandy, okay? So those areas that are flat and sandy, and, and in those areas are also riverine areas of floods. Huh? Places in Iraq have a lot of flooding. Uh, it's difficult to conceive of that to be that way, but yes, there's the Euphrates River and many other river basins in the Middle East. And most of the clays are lacustrine clays, clays that were deposited by water that are also susceptible to dusting. So even though you may not have terrain of the type in the stands, in the Vakani stands, Northern China and all of that in a lot of the Middle East, but you have river basins where silt and clays generate dust. And in some cases, dunes, sand dunes migrates. So these geotechnical measures, some of them will apply. For example, dune stabilization methods that are geotechnical will apply to many parts of the Middle East. Another one will be stabilization of those lacustrine like clays using polymers and other measures of dust control. Yes, so not all of them will apply, but those particular two categories will apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have Professor uh, Dian Singh from India. I think he has raised his hand. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Singh, uh, we cannot hear you. Can you unmute? Yeah. Hi, Larry. Uh, excellent talk. How are you oh, doing? Excellent. <laughs> nice, nice, yeah. nice to see you. So something on a philosophical note, uh, where uh, let's say stabilization of erodible soils uh, and geotechnical engineering practices are going contradictory to each other because uh, there are guys who are trying to conserve uh, the deserts or the sand dunes. And uh, you know they are very particular about nature and preserving the the erodible soils. Of course, I, mean, I understand the geotechnical engineers are facing tough times. So, so what's your overall picture? You know about uh, what should be done as a geotechnical engineer? Whether we should stabilize the soils which are erodible or not? <laughs> yes, um, uh, this is very important for uh, this is a, uh, an excellent question and remark and observation. Um, I'll even broaden it out. Um, you know, the United States is a country uh, where you have many people that uh, we call them green people. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner at all. Uh, Greenpeace is very active and all that. And uh, most of us that were in government uh, was at the US Environmental Protection Agency always had this dilemma. The dilemma that is raised by your remark uh, then, is the environment there to save people or to save the interests, uh, just the anomalous interests of the world? Uh, and there are two categories of uh, thought in this, uh, which you have actually mentioned. One is that there are people who feel that the environment itself has a personality that should never be uh, defiled. And there are some people who think that whatever personality the environment has is subservient to human personality. Um, it's very difficult to take aside. Uh, well, in developing countries where, and I uh, being somebody who belongs both to the uh, developed world by nationality and also to the developing world by birth, um, I can understand both. Uh, if you have some people in the developing world uh, who have to have infrastructure to serve their economy so that they can elevate their standard of living and uh, the GDP of the country would improve as a result of inf infrastructural improvements that would bring in foreign direct investment, where like the BRI, 
uh, is likely to do in many countries. And I dare not say that just be a right. Maybe the, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals, which is the Western the DRI would do this argue that we shouldn't give preference uh, to all efforts uh, to improve the economy, be there stabilization of sand dunes so that pipelines can do well, uh, stabilization of the roadway so that trucks can run well and convey goods from uh, India to some other place and all that so poor people can elevate their quality of life. And then people like me and you, my dear friend, who have a little bit more income than the rest, can afford to have the cleanest environment, a pristine environment <laughs> that, because we can afford that luxury. So this is why I think, um, and this is just my opinion, and I think there's sufficient evidence and sufficient rationale on the other side too, of people who say, let's look at it in the long term. Let's not uh, take uh, benefits now that defile the future. So yes, my own is to establish and establish. If you look at it in Africa, should Africa have a pristine environment and some people can barely uh, uh, survive on less than a dollar a day? I think that um, some of the natural resources uh, might be somewhat compromised as a result of trying to establish a balance uh, between environmental sustainability and the current realities of uh, poverty and all that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think okay. uh, maybe any other questions? Uh, I don't have a question, but I just want to say hi. Oh, you got my good Look at you. How are you? How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm happy to see you. Good. good seeing you. Great presentation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. How is it in California? How's, how is it out there in California? Everything is good. Yes, it's it's about one uh, a.m. Let me let, let, that, let me let me let others know that uh, Professor Brill at the University at California State University was a contributor to very many of the polymer soil interactions research that we did, as reflected in a number of journal articles and uh, and so forth. Yes, so I'm very happy to see him. Uh, he dwarfs me now. <laughs> okay. How are you? Yeah, happy to see you, too, Dr. Nguyen. Very good. Thank you. We have to continue our collaboration. Eh? Don't forget that. <laughs> so, yes. Very good. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think uh, with this, um, I would like to thank Professor Inyang for his wonderful talk. And also we have very insightful discussion on BRI and uh, how geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering can help in BRI projects. Uh, so now we move to next session. Uh, it uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Luca Shinetto. I think he's also with us. He will give talk on development of innovative optical fiber sensors and system for dikes and debris flow. So maybe after a while, we will start with Dr. Luca. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.